it'd be nice if we were able to embrace a little bit of a nuance again. Everything seems so finite and black and white, and there's a lot of like you know bandwagon jumping and stuff that, because of social media. Yeah, and, uh, it's true. It's true. I'll get off my soapbox now because because no, no. I could go for a half an hour on that. Says what it wants, but it's all contradicted. He's a man of conviction, but he's, but he's never been convicted. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. This is uh, the second episode of the second season, but it's still, I guess, number 21. So I've done 21 of these so far. Today, lucky 21, Rick Austin. Uh, he's going to be joining me by phone. Please look forward to that. I'll tell you a little bit about Rick in a second. Um, many of you know that I was planning this trip to Barcelona, ultimately, uh, to do this travel show. I was going to be learning Danish in a month, but Danish is a bit like torture. So I switched to Catalan and um, shooting a month in Barcelona. But this damn virus came along and, you know, shut those plans down. But that's okay. I, I'm... I watched almost 200 episodes of this uh, Catalan soap opera called uh, Com Si Fosa Ir, uh, as if it was yesterday. And I was ready, man, but uh, I guess next year. So I've known Rick Austin for 30 years. We've worked together on various projects from MTV Movie Awards to the Mark Twain Prize. We've worked in Venezuela. We worked in Miami. I stayed with him in New York when I had a short job there. He's been an executive at Fox, at the Sci-Fi Channel. He's worked on all of the Comedy Central roasts. Um, the guy never stops working. He's got this story with Eric Clapton and Bob Dylan that will make your jaw drop. He's from Proctor, Vermont, near Rutland. Interesting fact for you, Vermont is one of the only original 13 colonies that is landlocked so just wanted to throw that out there rick uh, went to maris college um, upstate new york he's got some crazy stories to tell um, this really ended up being almost one of the longest podcasts i've done we've known each other for so many years there's so many stories uh, we didn't even get to all of them and i was shocked to learn that i was his first podcast you guys are in for a real treat listen up here comes rick austin All right, I'm on the line here with my friend Rick Austin. Uh, Rick, thanks for joining me from Studio City, right? That's where you live? Yes, I'm in beautiful Studio City, uh, about, what, seven or eight miles from you? Yeah, I mean, I'm here in Van Nuys, and, um, you know, we're doing this over the phone lines, so there may be a little bit of, uh, you know, confusion, but I think, we're, I think this is the way to do it. I think we'll be good. I think we'll be good. And we're recording with our incredibly uh, um, professional microphones, so hopefully it won't sound like a Zoom call to people at home. So we've known each other, I'm, I think I figured out, was 1990 or 89? You might have even come out in 89. Yeah, I think the first time, the first memory of you and I together was uh that i have is uh going to see batman in westwood like the like the 80s batman with michael keaton right at, right like the and fox you, theater in westwood and you had a uh bmw and a beard and you and you you <laughs> you were out doing something from from new york and yes right? i totally yeah. remember this yeah we we were out shooting something and mtv back at the time i worked at mtv in the 80s and 90s and mtv at the time didn't really they weren't nearly as corporate as they are now so it was a lot of sort of like freewheeling running and gunning and people not really paying attention to what was going on so i think we were <laughs> we were out here shooting something we had a bmw convertible and then I was given the task of returning the Beamer. And uh, and I was, I'd already decided to stay out here another two or three days. So I was like, I'm just going to keep the Beamer. And like, they told me to return it on Friday. If I return it on Sunday, nobody's even going to notice. So I just, I think, nice. Uh, nice. I think our friend Steve and I went out to Palm Springs with it. <laughs> And uh, I was just driving it around with the top down in L.A. I mean, L.A. was like a fantasy world for me at the time. So uh, it was like, uh, you know, it was like a California fantasy be, be driving around in your Beamer convertible. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it was through Steve that we met. Like, he was working for my aunt at her little, like, 
um, Hollywood Who Done It, which is like IMDb, but in in a published form. And yeah, yeah, and he was working there, and I met you and Anthony Kaleka and Tony and all these people uh, that Mike Larkin and. Um, yeah, it was cool. It was like a nice connection to like a whole bunch of entertainment people from the East Coast that I really would have never met uh, otherwise. So, right, and you were still in at USC at the time, right? Yep, I was still still at school. Yep. Yeah, guys, I remember you in film school making your little short films, and I think you pitched me a couple of ideas, or we talked about a couple of ideas for short films you could do for your class. And I, I didn't you put. Um, didn't you have Machete in one of your films? Didn't you have uh, Danny Trejo uh, in one of your films? No, but it's it's a guy named Emilio Rivera who is he's one of Trejo's guys. Yeah, he was in he's he's the Mayans. He's the guy, the head guy in Mayans. He was in the Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. Solid actor. Yeah, it was it was so cool to uh to him for him to be in my film. Yeah, he 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 gave me great performance. Bleeding Angel. It was based on a Tom Waits song, Romeo is Bleeding that I that I oh, loved. Yeah. And well, I, you and I, I are both giant Tom Waits fans. Totally, totally. Um, we yeah, definitely bonded over that. So you were uh, worked on all kinds of different shows at MTV, right? Various, they, mo- they moved you around. And... <clears throat> yeah, I mean, back in the 80s, I, I sort of started at a, at a, a college in upstate New York called Maris College, known for uh, not much, really. Known for uh, basketball teams, we had Division One basketball teams. I went to school with the only famous person to come out of Marist in the '80s was Rick Smith's All Star Center for the Indiana Pacers. Right, we had a that's fairly right. good basketball team and uh, and a fairly good internship program. That's the only reason I went there, and so I got an internship at MTV. I sort of figured out the one smart thing I did in college was figure out my liberal arts credits so that I could do a an internship second semester senior year full time hoping that somebody would give me a job so i you did mtv and took the train down from poughkeepsie to new york five times a week i basically worked full time at mtv as an intern and then just sort of lucked into a job as a tape librarian as the tape librarian for mtv in 1987 wow and <laughs> i mean you know if you go to mtv now it's just like a gigantic corporate thing with just like massive amounts of staff but at the time it was me in a basically a long closet with a bunch of three quarter inch videotapes and people from the vj section or people from the news section would come in and go i need the i need the uh stevie nicks uh interview and right. uh i dig it out for them and ma- and kind of make friends with them so i became kind of like a a little go-to guy for a bunch of different people at MTV and managed to work my way up into letting them, you know, letting me pick out a sound bite for a uh, roll in for news or let me help cut some little thing to roll in or then let me work on one of the rockumentaries or something. So that's how I sort of like scratched and clawed my way up through the uh, MTV Wild West um, kind of production <laughs> in the 80s. And um, when did you uh, hook up with Joel Gallen and the MTV Movie Awards and, and stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, Joel came in like a year after me. I remember being like a PA and an AP at, at, at um, MTV. And uh, he replaced a guy who was a great guy named Ray, Rene Garcia. But I was I was like a, a youngster back then and sort of intimidated by Rene and his haircut. He had a very intimidating haircut. <laughs> um and uh beautiful hair though beautiful 80s hair and uh joel came in to replace him and run what is uh called long form programming at the time and uh i remember thinking okay this new guy's coming in this is my chance to sort of like uh impress him and not be intimidated so i sort of tried to talk to the guy like uh like uh, a little bit more of an equal and i think he was impressed by a couple of stupid little creative things i did on couple things and we sort of hit it off and I ended up working on a lot of stuff with him still to this day work with him a lot you know but we started out uh the first big thing I did at MTV was the um a show called The Big Picture with Chris Connolly oh yeah I remember that yeah and Chris is still you know still out there doing stuff worked with ESPN great guy it was sort of a half hour movie review show 
uh, just rolling in clips from movies and interviewing people. So I got to go and do all of these uh, press junkets in the 80s and 90s. Right. <laughs> Which I don't know if you've ever been a part of those things, but um, they're sort of a nightmare. But at the same time, like I can look back and think of all of these now kind of classic movies that I went and was like the 35th person to interview Keanu Reeves for Point Break or something. Right, right. You know? <laughs> um, so I sort of became like one of the quote unquote movie people at MTV. And uh, that's where uh, the uh, MTV Movie Awards sort of was born out of that show and um, um, out of some of the movie specials we'd done. And Joel was responsible for that. So that was sort of like the first, you know, big thing that I'd done with Joel Gallen at MTV. Very cool. Yeah, I forget what year it is. We worked on the movie awards with when uh, Janine Garofalo and Ben Stiller were hosting. Was it yeah. the 98 96, or 90, 96? 96. 1996. Yeah. yeah, Ben Stiller and Janine Garofalo hosted. And I remember I was working in Miami at the time. Right. And uh, uh, still, uh, still loved being part of the show in any way I could. I had worked on all pretty much all of them previously and we did a thing on the show for a lot of years called the uh, lifetime achievement award but you know the mtv movie awards was basically a comedy show you know because we realized that you know hollywood wasn't going to take these awards seriously like they did the oscars or the golden right. globes or something right so it's like why not make this thing like a dumb comedy show and uh <laughs> and do like parodies of movies and like make everything you know at the time at the time it was kind of unique you know a lot of award shows do it now but you know mtv movie awards was probably the first like completely ridiculous award show you know absolutely absolutely and uh yeah in 96 you know we you know we had established this uh you know kind of tradition of giving away a lifetime achievement award to somebody who kind of doesn't deserve one but a, but at the same time completely does like jason from friday the 13th or uh clint howard <laughs> ron's brother right uh, totally uh, but in 96, we gave it to Godzilla. And uh, I remember I didn't know how to edit at the time. I'm, I can sort of find my way around an avid ed, uh, media composer program these days. But um, at the time, I, I, I knew what I wanted, but I needed somebody to edit for me. So I remember you had gotten really good at avid. You had been so for a few years, right? That's right. And... Um, so I think we flew you down to edit with me and put together this uh, all, tribute yeah, time to Godzilla. Code. We knew exactly <laughs> where all the shots were. We just had to like pull those all off of the off of the digi beta tapes, and then yeah, and Oh my God! Yeah, it was tongue in cheek, but also a big tribute to like this monster we all love. So I think they had Sir yeah, oh, Patrick I ha Stewart. I have it. I'm gonna. I'll put it. I'll, I'll put it on. Oh yeah, I have it. Yeah, I'll put it on the. Uh, you have it on the website. Oh yeah, put it up. Uh, uh, it's out there somewhere. Yeah, Patrick Stewart uh, introduced this giant of the acting world, and then they rolled our package, which was uh, I think we cut it to. Uh, Mama said, "Knock you out" by LL Cool J. Oh man! And, <laughs> and Whitney Houston's uh, Olympic song, <laughs> "One Moment yeah. in Time." And uh, yeah, the long version, dude. It's it's it was epic. It was so good. <laughs> I don't know if you. I don't know if I if I told you last year when Godzilla: King of the Monsters came out that uh, they completely ripped us off. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. They uh they did a whole ad campaign. They did a whole series of, of TV ads where they cut clips from Godzilla King of the Monsters to Mama Said Knock You Out by LL Cool J, which is, you know, sort of an obvious idea. But I watched them, and literally they, they cut it exactly the way somebody went and found this old piece online. And because they had cut shots exactly the same way that we had cut it. And wow. I remember thinking, wow. yeah, I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember thinking uh, that I was sort of honored that there was somebody at, I think it was a Warner Brothers movie, that had maybe remembered that Godzilla was on the movie awards, and maybe remembered that piece and went like, oh yeah, that was cool when they, when they, uh, when they cut damage, boom, and he was like, you know, <laughs> crushing buildings and 
you know, Tower of Power. Yeah. It, it was, it was, um, it was flattering, and I, I no checks arrived in the mail, but um, <laughs> it's still, it's still nice to be, you know, ripped off. I think everybody can. Everybody's been ripped off in this business. It's like being in a comedy club and you you hear somebody a joke and then ten years later you think you came up with that joke and you're like no no dude you heard that in my act in Miami that one time or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that that happens in this town and it's like people change things five percent, ten percent, and it, you know call it a completely new product. But there's it's very difficult to sue over that kind of stuff and like so you just kind of like take it as a compliment and move on yeah because you know everybody's intentionally or unintentionally ripping everybody else off anyway like um my friend ross matthews he he put in a in a tweet somewhere that you guys should take the dorito and make it into a taco shell you're welcome and like they did it (laughs) and i think they gave him credit for it (laughs) thanks for the idea or whatever but yeah that's one of the greatest ideas of the last 10 years there's documented proof that that he suggested that to them and then you know whatever a few months later it came out and he doesn't get a cut of every taco i don't think so oh man can you imagine if you got one penny for every doritos loco taco uh that they sold he would already be retired (laughs) yeah i have to admit though like i'm not a big taco bell fan but i had to go a friend of mine said that those things were almost too tasty like Way too much flavor all happening at once, so I had to go try one out, and they're incredible. Do they still yeah. even do them? I think, I think they, they do. Yeah, yeah, they have to. So, now I want Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to have some Taco Bell, and we'll, we'll <laughs> no, be I'm right back. I'm just going to order Grubhub. <laughs> That's you right. You don't mind if I eat while we talk, do you? <laughs> no, it's fine. Go for it. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, I know you have a, a story about Chewbacca that uh, – you you may want to share. Well, yeah, he was another lifetime achievement award winner. I think uh, I think in '97, the year after Godzilla, everybody was like, "How are we going to top Godzilla?" And somebody, I think Joel said, "Is there anybody from Star Wars like R two D two or something we could give it to?" And I said to Joel, uh, "Well, the thing that every hardcore Star Wars fan like myself is bent out of shape about is that Chewie did not get a medal at the end of Star Wars." after he hung his hairy ass out there like everybody else and helped to blow up the Death Star. But because he's a Wookiee, he doesn't get a medal like only humans get medals. I mean, Princess Leia hands out Han and Luke a medal, and and, and Chewie's just standing there at the end of the movie just going, like, where the hell's my medal? That, that's what he was saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so let's give Chewie the Lifetime Achievement Award, but make it a medal, you know? And if we can book Carrie Fisher to actually give it to him, then it's like this poetic justice happening. So we, uh, so we did it, and uh, um, it was a great. It was like it's like one of the one of the greatest moments of my career to be like this little moment in Star Wars that uh, where Chewie finally got his medal. If you've seen Rise of Skywalker, you see that Chewie gets his medal in Rise of Skywalker. But I consider the MTV Movie Awards Star Wars canon. So of course, he already got it. So that was, they could have just cut that part out of Rise of Skywalker because it was a bit repetitive. (laughs) But, um, but the best part of that whole experience was that, you know, as part of this, we do a little montage like we did with you. And we decided we wanted to put Chewbacca on Larry King uh, (laughs) as part of this montage and have, have Larry King interview him like he's just another actor. Right. So we flew over. From um, England, Peter Mayhew, who plays Chewie, or played Chewie. He's departed now. Rest in peace, Peter. Yes. And, of course, MTV and all of their uh, budget-cutting wisdom flew a seven-foot-six guy over from London coach. So uh, (laughs) he literally, like, almost couldn't walk when he got off the plane because he had to bury his knees into his chest to, like, fly over to from London and Lucasfilm was going to send us the actual Chewbacca costume from their their stores for Peter Mayhew to put on like literally for the first time since Return of the Jedi wow and uh they were like well we uh we don't we don't feel comfortable like sending this uh this you know very important prop costume to uh to the hotel for Peter so where are we gonna 
where are we going to send this thing? And I was like, just send it to me. <laughs> so I sort of said that half jokingly and they're like, oh, well, yeah, okay, great. You'll look for, you'll look after it. And literally like the next day, this giant crate shows up at my tiny studio apartment in a university place in New York. And this huge thing shows up and it's just like spray painted Lucasfilm Limited on the side. And I'm like, I have the Chewbacca costume in my apartment right now. You took pictures, I'm, right? No, I couldn't. I, that's this is the this is the biggest regret of my life is that the thing was locked and I couldn't open it. And I wanted I would have put it on and walked around the village, of course, but like the thing was <laughs> locked up. <laughs> but we somehow got it to uh, Larry King live, and Peter Mayhew was there, and he put the costume on for the first time since Return of the Jedi. I was in the green room of Larry King live with Ivana Trump and uh, sports commentator Dick Chep and Chewy, and like that conversation was awkward to say the I, least. But uh, wow! <laughs> <laughs> but the. Uh, but seeing Chewie, seeing Peter Mayhew put the eye black around his eyes and put the mask on for the first time since Return of the Jedi and look at me, all of a sudden he's Chewbacca and he's looking at me and it was genuinely thrilling and strange and like for a tiny moment, Chris Kresge, another, uh, uh, the late Chris Kresge, who was a beautiful, beautiful person and great, funny uh, writer and myself, sat there uh, in awe of like being able to look Chewbacca in the eye and it was fun and funny and Larry King uh, did a little interview with him <laughs> and it was ridiculous. Wow. Well, that's God, man. That's uh, you'll never forget that. No, it's sort of like as a Star Wars, as a guy, as a kid growing up in Vermont, like riding his bicycle to see Star Wars 12 times when, you know, he was, when I was 11 years old and then all of a sudden getting to like hang out with Chewie um, is one of those things that like makes working in this business uh, worthwhile. How about let's talk about South America for a minute? Just as a just in general, you want to talk about the continent <laughs> facts? Well, you know, <laughs> the, the, I got a phone call from Bart Lipton. Hey, you want to come to Venezuela? I'm here with Rick Austin, and and we wanted you to come down. I know that was like such a weird coincidence. We've worked on two continents together. But I remember, yep. you know, my friend Josh Greenberg, another great friend of mine from MTV, had been hired by this company called Palomar Pictures to go down to Caracas, Venezuela, to sort of take over um, launching this music video channel that was sort of like MTV. Basically, in the in the United States, record companies can't own their own music video channels because of, I guess, antitrust laws or some other laws because they just play their own artists and exclude all the other artists. But in South America, there's no such law. So there was two or three record companies that gotten together and to create this music video channel like MTV to literally just play, I think it was Sony artists and a couple other artists. A couple Warner other Brothers, artists. yeah. Warner Brothers, yeah. Yeah, so they were launching this channel, and I, and I guess it had sort of started to fall apart because there was some German guy who was running it who was just spending all the money and not getting anything done and doing lots of nefarious things. So they fired him and brought Josh. Josh called me up and said, hey, you want to work in Venezuela? But literally, we, you, you have to leave in two days. <laughs> and so we, so I, I, up, I had to update my passport and get to Venezuela. And uh, Bart Lipton was another guy working down there. And uh, we realized we needed, you know, some editors to like put together these promos and these other things. And we looked at each other and said, like, we have to have a, an editor who speaks Spanish. Do you know anybody? And uh, like I said, I know this guy, Matt Gosson. And he's like, I know Matt Gosson. <laughs> so he was like the, you were the first person on his mind and mine and my mind. And uh, I think we called you up and literally you were down in a couple of days, right? Yep. I was like, let's go. This sounds great. <laughs> it was a really fun time, but it was really kind of crazy no one was really overseeing us that much and i think it was it was connected to hbo in some way but it was literally like yeah like make some promos and make some things and think up some shows and uh think up a logo and uh, it needs to be on the air in like a month and a half so we were out like shooting stupid promos that we just thought up and did and 
it's probably a little bit like the way they launched the first, the original MTV in 81, where it's just like some creative people going, what else can we do? It was fun. I remember uh, working very hard at the beginning of it and then not so much at the end because the other editors, the, the locals had kicked in and they were sort of taking over and I was just sort of making sure they were on top of it. But yeah. Uh, the cool, the stuff I remember most is our, our our trips. We went to Margarita Island. We went to um, went to Aruba. I mean, you can't go to another, con- you know, another continent and not try to like take advantage of exactly being in a place where you can explore. So yeah, we had some fun little trips, and there was some also some sketchy stuff. I mean, I remember we we all stayed in this hotel. What was it called? The Euro Building Hotel. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there were bullet holes in the glass from when there was a, like an attempted coup. <laughs> yeah, at the I remember. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you could take the elevator up to the top floor and see two major bullet holes, like from a you know from a uh, an airplane type of yeah. bullet holes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like major, like you know, fifty cal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, which was you know you assume there probably wouldn't be another armed uprising while we were there, but you. I mean, it was Venezuela, which is a little bit of a, you know, I think now you can, can Americans even travel to Venezuela? I mean, the place the place was sketchy when we got there, and I think it went way downhill after yeah. we left. It, yeah, it completely fell apart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah, it's awful what's happened there. Did you guys, we used to take these, um, we used to take these vans to and from work because nobody, you know, nobody could just rent a car or we weren't all like traveling separately we all had to sort of travel in a group right and were you on the van that got pulled over by the cops and shook down no Do you, i you heard about this? that though i know that didn't yeah. happen to me no yeah the cops pulled over i think it was uh maybe josh greenberg and a couple other guys were traveling home after the day's work and cops pulled them over pulled guns on them i guess and basically just wanted all their money and then let them go Wow. I wasn't part of that. No, but, uh, me either. Damn. That would be... I've never had a gun pulled on me. I have. Really? Well, I supposedly have. Somebody uh, wrapped their T-shirt in their hand as they were following me in the dark this way, <clears throat> and said they had a gun. And who was I to, you know, tell them... Yeah, when someone ah, says you, bro- you have a gun, just go with that. <laughs> yeah. Just go with it. <laughs> yeah. So I gave them my money and ran away, and it was turned out fine. Yeah. But yeah, it was frightening. Yeah, just the idea that somebody uh, could, at any moment, pull a trigger must yeah. be a great motivator to just hand your money over. It, it seems I mean, to why? work. Yeah. Nobody should be a hero in that, in that situation. No. Give them your money. Take off. So uh, another thing that you did that uh, you've worked on several Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductions, uh, ser- yeah. right, at the, the, the live ceremonies that they do. Um you, yeah, you, I've lost you, count of how many we've done, and we're doing it again after several years of not doing it. But um, yeah, it had been done in the uh, it had started in the '80s with um, Bill Graham, the legendary San Francisco uh, promoter producer, had overseen the the '80s versions of it that all took place at the Waldorf Astoria, in New York, and they weren't broadcast; they were just sort of filmed for posterity. Right, and I think they wanted to move towards. Uh, model where they could be they could be broadcast somewhere so um so they brought joel gallon in um who had had some success at mtv doing big award shows like the vmas and the movie awards at the time i think 1993 was the first one that i worked on and i've worked on many many uh rock and roll hall of fames the most fun thing to do is to on those shows is to edit the montages for the people getting in especially if you're a fan and often if you're not a fan you become a fan uh, editing these um, sort of tribute montages, so I've gotten to do so many of those. From I did the Prince and U2 and the Doors and Al Green. I've done. I've gotten to do so many of them, and then watch the people Metallica. I think watch the people watch them, and when when you when you can be in the house and you see the artist you're trying to honor in some way, watch their piece and not be disgusted by it i remember ray manzarek uh standing next to ray manzarek and somebody you know some stage manager had said oh your your montage is gonna run now and he was like i've seen all this footage a billion times and then as it was running you could see it sort of caught his attention and uh 
you could tell he was like, oh, that was pretty good. That's awesome. Um, those are rewarding little moments. Th- those are the people you're actually making it for, right? I mean, yes. In a way, you you it really is for them that they approve it and 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 honor it. But yeah, that's yeah that that must be super satisfying. Uh, shit. Yeah, that's the only people that you want to have like it. If everybody else hates it, but the artist thinks it's brilliant. I mean, I got to do the Tom Waits one. Speaking of Tom Waits, and uh, oh, so jealous. Oh uh, yeah, it was so great to see him. Got to speak to him briefly. Got to speak to his wife Kathleen a lot more, and she's a wonderful, you know. Co- she seems she conspirator. seems amazing yeah yeah and co-conspirator and co-writer of a lot of his songs and oh yeah uh oh, yeah. she gave me a big hug afterwards but like yeah being able to find the vibe for these things that that honor their vibe in a way and their musical kind of situation is uh in a way that communicates that their genius to people that may not be very aware of them right right is uh is great uh yeah leonard cohen i got to do and then i got to see the footage of lou reed and leonard cohen watching it backstage and uh and enjoying it or at least not being at least not being disgusted by it that's great man it's nice but yeah those these are the moments in in working in this where you get to have a, a little proximity to these people that you admire so much and obviously you're insignificant in their world you know but uh Oh, but, what about Eric Clapton? It wasn't Eric Clapton. Yeah, uh, Eric Clapton. In there? Not the ni- yeah, the ninety three show was still to this day one of the most uh, star studded, or not star studded, but just sort of like if you're a fan of rock and roll and you get to uh, you get to be in a rehearsal space where in an hour period you see the doors reform <laughs> for the first time, and I think maybe since you know the early seventies or right after you know Jim died. Wow, and per, and practice and try to figure out how to how light my fire goes again, you know, with Eddie Vedder. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and then see uh, Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce and Eric Clapton walk into the rehearsal space and hug each other for the first time since their like Albert Hall show, I think, in seventy or sixty nine or something. Amazing. <laughs> figure out how to play "Sunshine of Your Love" again. How's it go? Do, 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 do. Is that too slow? Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and you're standing there going like, it's sort of like, I feel like I shouldn't even be in this room right now because there's classic rock greatness like happening in front of me. Um, yeah, you'll I'll always have those like little moments to look back on and go like, that was a tiny little classic rock part of history that I got to stand next to. <laughs> I remember that 93 show. Being on the side of the stage during the actual show, which was one of the only ones that they'd done here in Los Angeles, uh, was at some ballroom in in Century City that I think doesn't exist anymore. But it was uh, on stage was uh, John Fogarty and Robbie Robertson and Bruce Springsteen all playing a Creedence Clearwater Revival song because Creedence got in that year too. And uh, I'm standing there and then Eric Clapton comes up and stands next to me and kind of gives me a look like, hey, what's up? This is cool. And so I'm like, okay, it's me and Eric Clapton grooving to Credence. That's great. And then this other dude shows up and stands next to me, and he looks like the Unabomber. Some guy comes and stands next to me. He's got a hoodie on and sunglasses. And I'm like, who's this guy? Should I call security? And then he, like, leans over and goes like, hey, Eric. And, and And I realize I'm standing between Eric Clapton and Bob Dylan. And I sort of like, let me step back while you two hug each other. And then like all three of us just stood there and watched the whole rest of the performance. And uh, that w- I was just sort of like, what do I, do I have to walk away? Do I, can I stand here? Am I allowed to? This is. <laughs> that's, that's wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Shit. And the weirdest part of that story is about 10 years later, we were doing this other show on the lawn of the White House for I, I might have been a VH1 Save the Music special or a very special Christmas thing or something, but Eric Clapton was involved, uh-huh. and he came. Uh, uh, some of the what it was like during the Clinton administration, and some of the Clinton staffers and myself and some other people were hanging out at the bar afterwards. And Eric Clapton comes walking in just by himself, like and comes up to him, just starts hanging out with us, talking, and somehow he started telling this story about being on the side of a stage at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and having Bob Dylan 
And then Bob Dylan just sort of walked up, and and I'm like, he's telling me a story that I'm in, and he doesn't know I'm in it. <laughs> and I'm like, I was, I just happened to be standing next to you at the time, and he was like, what? <laughs> I think is he was like, I can't even process what you're saying right now. <laughs> wow, what are the, what are the chances? That's crazy, dude. <laughs> it was a weird like Mobius loop of fame that I'm caught in. Yep. <laughs> Amazing! Wow. Yeah, some weird little little subcurrent of the pop culture river that like Eric Clapton and I got caught in briefly. But those those are fun to think about. You know, um, it's you know, it's a like a little mic, little microscopic moment in Eric Clapton's life. But like, it's a big moment in my life. <laughs> that just the fact that it, first of all, the fact that it happened is crazy, and then that that you were. It, it was being spoken about with you. <laughs> it's just insane, dude. I know. It's like, he's telling, why, he, wait a minute. He's telling this story right now? I was about to just tell him this story. Oh, man. It, um, through, through, uh, through Joe Gallen, you also, is he also involved with the Mark Twain Prize, right? No, Joel, um, that was through a company called Done and Dusted, a bunch of British guys. Oh, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, there was a, the, the Mark Twain Prize is like the biggest award in comedy. And uh, I've been lucky enough to have a little bit of experience in comedy with Joel and with MTV, you know, doing the Comedy Central Roast for many years. One of the first jobs I had at MTV was doing this show called the Half Hour Comedy Hour, uh, which was sort of a stand-up comedy show on MTV. Uh huh. But yeah, for, for maybe 20-something years, the Mark Twain Prize, which is given by the Kennedy Center, sort of the Kennedy Center Honors of Comedy, but it was... Uh, it was a, it was produced by the same people for about twenty years, and it sort of sort of gotten into a rut of sameness. So I think the uh, the Kennedy Center reached out to Dunn and Dusted um, in two thousand eighteen, and uh, brought me in to help produce uh, the Julia Louis Dreyfus um, Mark Twain Prize. She won it in two thousand eighteen, mm-hmm. and uh, that was fun. But last year, uh, they gave it to the GOAT, Dave Chappelle. And that was really, really inspiring thing to work on because Dave Chappelle's a genius. And uh, it gave us an opportunity to try to think outside the box and, and do some stuff that was uh, different than a typical award show. And we shot, we kind of juxtaposed like Dave Chappelle in the Kennedy Center with a bunch of people in tuxedos. And then we shot this whole other thing with Dave just like stream of consciousness stand up with a bunch of people getting up on stage and kind of like honoring him at the comedy club in Washington where he got his start. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it went, it went from like, you know, this like 5,000 people in a room to like 40 people in a room and listening to Dave. I mean, Dave Chappelle can get on a stage with like no material planned and talk for two hours of, and it's hilarious. And that's basically what he did. And we had, we didn't even really have any idea if he was even going to show up to do it. We had all these cameras there, and it was like, he says he's coming, and we have no idea what's going to happen. It was sort of seat of your pants, but Dave just got on stage and just went. And uh, it was brilliant. He kind of, like, took you through his whole career. And, yeah, that was a that was a fun one to do that aired on PBS. It's on Netflix now, plug, if anybody wants to see, see it. So I, I would love it if anybody listening would check out that show because— um, first of all, if you love Dave Chappelle, it's hilarious and it's heartfelt and you'll probably see a side of Dave that you've never seen before. Um, and we're, we're all just really proud of that show. Um, and so you took that, that time that he talked and just edited it down to sort of a something or how did that work? Yeah. yeah we kind of tried to use it as a, um, as a through line through the show, almost like a, like a narrative that would get you from one place to another. So there'd great, be, great. you know, Tiffany Haddish on stage, and then it would sort of roll into a backstage moment with Tiffany and then roll into uh, Chris Tucker on stage talking about Dave and kind of sprinkled Dave moments throughout the show that kind of set up moments that you were going to see at the Kennedy Center. Great. And it was, uh, you know, it was one of those serendipity things where he just talked about things that we realized could be used as sort of signposts throughout the show, and um, and it all kind of worked and was funny and you know and heartfelt and and gives you a whole new appreciation for that guy's genius, you know, because he sort of got a little bit of a bad rap in the last year or two with like uh, some of the stuff he'd said on his comedy specials, but that's Dave. Dave, you know, Dave says what's on his mind. 
and he doesn't care whether you like it or not. And more times than not, whether you agree with it or not, it's hilarious. And th- and, and I think that's the thing I've learned about comedy from being around some of these people is like, you don't have to agree with everything that everybody says, but you can appreciate the humor in it. Exactly. And, they can, uh, they're se- they're separate things. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and people just need to lighten up a little bit, I think. <laughs> and, you know, there's a, you know, we are, we are, we're obviously in this era where with social media and everything, people are being, you know, people are trying to cancel everybody for anything anybody's ever done in their entire history of their lives. And uh, and oft times it's deserved, <laughs> and sometimes it's not. I think, but um, it'd be nice if we were able to embrace a little bit of a nuance again. Everything seems so finite and black and white, and there's a lot of like you know bandwagon jumping and stuff that, because of social media. Yeah, and, uh, it's true. It's true. I'll get off my soapbox now because because no, no. I could go for a half an hour on that. Well, well and you God, don't want me to. I well, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about. Your Star Trek uh, allegiance. You're a uh, you're you're a full on admitted Trekkie from way from way back, right? Yeah. Shout out to my buddy Larry Young. If you're listening, uh, Larry, uh, uh, it was my high school buddy, still a buddy of mine, and uh, he and I became. You know, he was a big Trekkie, Trekker, or whatever you want to call it, science fiction fan, basically, from when I was growing up, and we were kindred spirits, and we became, you know hardcore star trek fans together i used to uh i used to tape the uh episodes first of all i used to tape the episodes on cassette tape before i even had a vcr and just listen to them yeah just listen to them there were two two channels that showed star trek when i was growing up one was uh, channel 11 wpix tv from new york which was probably the biggest single influence on my life that channel uh people from new york know what i'm talking about channel 11 was had everything cool, including Star Trek. And uh, uh, and then Channel 3 from Burlington, Vermont, would show it at like 11, 15 at night on a Sunday. So I would like tape them with my cassette tapes. And then when I finally like traded my Atari 2600 video game system for a Betamax VCR in 1982, I started like trying to collect them all by recording them off Channel 11 or Channel 3. Channel 11 would cut them up. They like cut, they literally just hack scenes out so they could put more commercials in. Oh. Um, they would literally like hack a scene out halfway through. They just hack it in half. So they, <laughs> so like if if you went back and watched some of the Star Trek episodes on Channel 11 today, they probably don't make a whole lot of sense because <laughs> people were just like, yeah, just cut it there when the guy walks in and says, what's going on? Just cut, just cut to the next scene there. And who knew you would you would end up? I think you were a VP at the Sci Fi Channel for a while. Were you not? <laughs> I was a VP at Sci Fi Channel. Like I think Destiny would bring me to the Sci Fi Channel. We uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, we started uh, we started we sort of relaunched Sci Fi Channel's identity in '99. Sort of changed the name to Sci Fi, not not S Y F Y, which it is now, I think. But we just lopped the channel off in '99. 90, uh-huh. And uh, and kind of repackaged the whole channel, and then uh, I sort of ended up at uh, out here in Los Angeles at uh, at a kind of the alternative division of Sci Fi Channel, which was basically trying to think of how reality shows and Sci Fi Channel can kind of interact. Probably the 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 thing I'm most proud of is what um, my friend Scott Halleck and his partner at the time Kevin Healy did a show called Scare Tactics that uh, was being developed when I came in. And uh, I continued to develop and got on the air, sort of a hidden camera, um, supernatural prank show. Yeah, I remember it. Um, that just scared the crap out of people. And uh, I was actually showing my 11-year-old Grace a uh, 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 Scare Tactics uh, episode today, and she was dying laughing. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we do, we would do things like... Uh, uh, you know, get a like the most realistic Bigfoot costume you've ever seen, and like bring people out into the woods in a camper, and then like have a Bigfoot attack and uh, uh, record it. And I showed her that one this morning, and she was lo- she was loving it. <laughs> nice. I'm hoping that show, uh, you know, comes back. That's a show that's that needs to come back. Uh, there's been a lot of Im- imitators out there, but. Uh, there's some there's some fans out there of Scare Tactics. Shout out to Scare Tactics fans. That was the most fun show I've ever worked on. I think. 
I bet. I bet. There's something. There's something just primal about the, watching somebody like scream like they're about to die, and then five seconds later they find out they're about to live instead. Yeah, they go through the whole range of emotions. <laughs> That's good television. So we we've been kind of locked down. Uh, COVID nineteen's got everybody in, in at home. Yeah. How are you guys? How are you guys doing? Oh, we're fine. I mean, you know, I, I have a, like a big backyard, and I can wander around and make it seem like I'm outside. So. Yeah, you do have a big backyard. It's like, I wish I had a big backyard right now. I've got, you know, a nice little pool and a little patio, but but it'd be nice to get the kid out, like, running around in the backyard. That's hard to do in the hills. Yeah, I guess you can go on little hikes, sort of. There's some private trails around, right? Or people are, I'm sure. Well, yeah, we've been taking walks in the neighborhood, and we did take one uh, hike up in the Angeles Crest Mountains. Um it's weird though because even some of these remote trails, if they're even still open, start to get crowded. And you're thinking like, "Oh, I'll be by myself in the wilderness," and then all of a sudden there's like 25 other people coming down the trail, and you can't get six feet away from them. And I can understand why they've closed all the trails in Los Angeles because they're getting, you know, especially on a Saturday or Sunday, get populated. I was out trying to run in Griffith Park last you know few days you know i had did a run yesterday and and it becomes tricky to avoid people yeah avoid people and like you can't really run with a mask on but you got to have a mask to maybe pull up over your face and then like you want to give people like a 20 foot berth and yeah it's crazy it's crazy times but we're doing we're doing okay you know the kid is you know your 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 wife's a teacher so how is how is that Going. Well, she's uh, she's uh, still. I don't know if you noticed. I, I put on Facebook. We've started a YouTube channel for her now. I've, we got like sixty videos we've done preschool videos I've shot for her. And, yeah. Um, I'm we be I'm more busy now than I have been in in years. Like seriously, we just sh- we got to shoot a few more, uh, but just t- ten of them for uh, for the next. The next week and then another 12 the following week and they're all wow. short and she's mostly just reading and then i'm cutting over her shoulder or following along and so that oh, they're, yeah. not, they're not too complicated some of them i have some graphics in there and but but just basically she's you know she's doing preschool videos all day and then the kids just click on them and watch them at home yeah she sends them to the links to her her class and uh and yeah, their moms sometimes sit with them. There's, you know, she does these little craft uh, projects where she um, shows shows them how to make a spider or how to make a little three little pigs scenario where you can tell the story over and over again. And they're they're basically four and five years old. So she, you know, she's talking to them like this, like you know, she's I right. call her I call her like a cult leader. She really talks to them like she's the leader <laughs> of this little little cult of little people. Um, <laughs> Man, you you I ha, you know I know that a lot of my friends feel the same way. You have a real renewed um, appreciation for teachers after your kids get locked down with you, and you have to get them to study, and get them to put their video games down, and get them to pay attention and do their homework. And you know, my kid has been getting on the Zoom calls every day for a couple hours, and. You know, which is great, but it's not the same. And then there's all this work that they have to do and, and that usually the teacher was helping with or the after school people were helping with. And all of a sudden it's like you got to mo- motivate them. So teachers are teachers are heroes, man. And like I hope that in this, you know, messed up age that we're in where everything seems to be backwards in terms of who gets glorified and who gets marginalized. Yeah. That we can remember who the real heroes are and like teachers are. At, right there at the top of my list. Yeah, I could I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. So you and I share a similar political affiliation, I believe. We, we I think we both would be considered maybe you know a little left of center, and oh, uh, yeah. we we operate in the same world of facts and science and stuff. You know, so yeah, or at least we like to think that we do. You know, maybe maybe there's times when you don't realize your own limitations or own prejudices but this is true this is true i'm I, i'd love to be corrected i i love to have somebody show me that that was on uh you know snopes and that 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 tweet was actually fake and i'm like okay well good i'm glad i'm absolutely i know that now yeah. 
the biggest frustration for me in the current state of politics is the lack of logic or the lack of an open mind to facts. You know, it's like I'm fine with, you know, my personal politics are very progressive. I think I'm also a realist because I just want the right person to be elected. So I was a briefly a Bernie Sanders supporter in 2016, probably mostly because I was from Vermont. Yeah. But but I switched to Hillary Clinton early on. And, you know, I'm, you know, Joe Biden was probably my 10th choice for nominee. <laughs> Same. <laughs> this year, but I'm all in, you know, because I just. I know, exactly. You have to be. You have to be realistic. But I would realized that in my past, I had respect for people on for conservatives because there was a, you know, uh, a set of rules that you could play by. Yeah. Or, at least, yeah. you know, in the words of Walter Sobchak, at least it's an ethos, you know, um, <laughs> but the but the uh, but where, where where it becomes cult like and where it becomes the denial of science and the de- denial of fact. And Donald Trump, if you if you dare to present facts to someone, you're you know, he's he's ousting someone else today you know or wants to someone who dared to question his ideas that this virus originated in a chinese lab like you know i don't care what your politics are i as long as you don't live in a fantasy world you know we can have an argument all day about the facts and about you know positions and what's best for this country but can we can we do it from a basis of of reality and facts and we got to get back to that It's like when 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 he's confronted in these recent news conferences that he's now not doing anymore. Yeah, it's infuriating. I've had to I've had to stop listening to him. And and you realize what sort of tactics he's using um, where he, you know, he he um, interrupts the people and the people, you know, he, he understands that reporters have a certain professionalism to them where they're not going to shout him down. And if he wants to start talking, they're going to stop talking. So he has this, these tactics he uses where he goes, excuse me, excuse me. Like if he doesn't want them to s- interrupt him to clarify what their position is, it's 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 infuriating and it's it's depressing and embarrassing and maddening for a country. You know, I, I used to, I have to admit, I used to be kind of, a, I used to find Trump's like sort of humorous. I didn't know much about the guy, and I never watched The Apprentice, and I always knew he was a blowhard. But I, I found him kind of charming because, in a weird, kind of he'll say anything kind of way, because he, he, that's his appeal, and he has this weird personality. You know, these these people who become these leaders based on their charisma. Mm-hmm. There's something to that. You know, I, we, I was, I was. I had one experience with the guy when we roasted him. We did the Comedy Central roast of Trump where I was around him twice for a few minutes. And I realized from that little proximity to him that there's something majorly wrong with the guy. You know, he has that cult of personality that he's tall and he knows how to dominate the conversation and that whole thing with the handshake that he does where it's all this manipulation of any situation he's in. And, you know, physical and mental domination over somebody that get, has gotten him so far in the world. And you see it happening in the press conferences, too, where he knows how to shut people up. He knows how to manipulate the situation. Um, he knows how to say whatever he's going to say to get through the next five minutes where people are going to call him out on things. Yep. It's all it's all uh, it's all depressing. It's hard to talk about too much and it's hard to laugh about too much. I feel the same. It's 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 frightening is what it, it is. <laughs> yeah. I actually feel a little bit better that maybe it's taken a pandemic to have even the staunchest of supporters begin to realize that he cannot make us safe. He cannot handle crises when it's starting to affect them, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm genuinely worried that in two to three weeks, we're going to see some increases in these states that have sort of opened up and who are just flaunting the idea that this thing is even dangerous. And yeah, that's what I'm really worried about, because then, it, you know who it's going to affect? The hospitals and the, the, the all the, uh, the, the nurses and everybody that has to deal with it. That's who are going to get yeah. fucked now because they decided, eh. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I hope this is overblown and it's not as bad as, as it seems. It, it seems, but it seems pretty bad. 
it's worse than it seems, I think. And they've already seen these spikes start to happen with people with these, you know, these uh, states that have opened up their beaches and uh, trying to move back to some sense of normalcy that really can't happen right now. And beginning to see spikes, you know, a couple of weeks later. Um, And yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. It's like part of you wants to go, well, if you're that stupid, then it's on you if you got it. But it's like, that's not just that. It's about how it's going to overwhelm our healthcare system again. It's already overwhelmed. Yeah. But and this and this isn't even the second wave. This would just be the first wave sort of getting a, a grip on it again. Yeah, I mean, things are going to be very, very different uh, for a while. A long you know? time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's frustrating to be, uh, you know, to be all in on the social distancing and the stay at home and see people even in your our own state of California and Huntington Beach and other places um, deciding it doesn't apply to them. What am I sacrificing for if you guys are going to go to the beach and uh, mingle openly with each other and spread the virus to who knows where? I guess people need to be explained that you or actually I think a governor said uh, recently, oh, I didn't realize that if you didn't have symptoms, you could also spread it. Well, if we had a federal government and an administration that would would disseminate that information in a timely concise understandable matter to all 50 states then you would be dealing with reality but you have a we have an administration that decides they're the backup plan and it's up to each individual state to figure it out what they want to do that's simply a blame uh, so he doesn't have to take the blame that's all that's about he's like well you know they did there and the people died because they opened up wasn't me no yeah everything every single calculation that Donald Trump makes is solely based on what's good for me right now. Yep. And that's it. Like there I don't think he's he's obviously been able not able to show the least bit of empathy towards the 60,000 people that have died. I think in his mind for him to even mention that 60,000 people have died is some sign of weakness or some right tacit admission that he had something to do with it, so I'm just not going to talk about it. Exactly. That's that's what it is. Disgusting to me. But yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, he's obviously a major uh, narcissist and has a has a very acute personality disorder. I mean, who can't diagnose that at this point? You know, and I don't think he sees anything outside of himself and his family as as real. I don't think he sees Americans as people. I sees them as statistics. Yeah. The only, his, own, his only reality is the thing that he makes up for himself every day that he finds comfortable to live in. And it usually involves like, what's good for me right now? I'm genuinely worried that come election time, all of a sudden we're going to, there's going to be like, you know, the illegals are trying to sway the election. Here, look at these pictures and put it this way. I doubt the election is going to go smoothly. Tra- the transition is going to go smoothly unless, you know. Biden somehow we find out that this accuser is real and he was a whole thing and then he goes you know he goes down hard and Trump wins and we're like oh well but if it goes the other way there's I do not see this man leaving uh, without an issue without a fight without some weird law he's going to enact or some false false flag something because for him to to walk out of there January twenty whatever it is is. Is, is means he's going to walk into cuffs, probably at least uh, some serious uh, legal issues. Oh, I agree. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't know what can legally happen that would allow him to challenge an election, especially an election that hopefully will not be close. You know, it's incumbent upon us as voters to show up, because the more people that show up, the greater the chance that Joe Biden can win in convincing fashion. Yeah. But no matter what, he's not going to accept the results that's going to be, you know, millions of illegals were busting places to vote. He can say that all day long, but that doesn't mean he can legally just decide he's just staying in office because he doesn't buy the results of the election. I mean, there's, I'm hopeful and, and I've read a little bit about, you know, Everybody was everybody was assuming he was going to try to use the pandemic to 
delay the election, and apparently there's zero chance that he can do that because even if we did delay the election, he still has to leave office in January if there's no if if no one is elected. It's not like, oh, I just get to stay forever now. But what if he defunds the post office and they can't even deliver the ballots to people or reliably d- deliver and return the ballots of people? Or what if a bunch of governors on his side, dis- you know, say that, oh, we had too many issues. We're going to have to do a redo. In the election will have to be next year. We're going to have re- we're going to redo the elections in January and then it'll get pushed to February. And then all of a sudden. He's in his second term, and it's and and it's un, going to be unprecedented. They're going to be saying that word again a lot. Yeah. Look, uh, obviously, he's proven that there's nothing that he won't do to try to maintain power, including like blackmail an Eastern European country to manufacture dirt on his opponent, opponent, right? Or or you know, deliver uh, aid only to red states so that they'll vote for him. Or, de- you know, demonize Democratic governors. Uh, there's obviously nothing that's a bridge too far for this guy. No. I think what hopefully will hold this together is as much as he as Donald Trump tries to manipulate the results of the election, if we crawl over glass to vote and show up no matter what, they shut down the post office, we storm the polling places, we need to make the results of the election definitive to the point I, where he can uh nothing he, he can, can do to deny it. yeah he can, yeah undeniable yeah where he can he can rail on the results of the election and claim that millions of illegals voted um but if if he's lost all the swing states and lost the senate and the you know the electoral college is massively in joe biden's favor then you would hope that most reasonable Americans and most reasonable politicians that are left would begrudgingly or otherwise accept the results. And he has to, you know, do a perp walk out of the White House into into, you know, the courts rooms in New York or whatever. But like right. I, I, I'm hoping that the the worst case scenario of Donald Trump delaying an election and grabbing power and declaring in a state of emergency is hopefully not realistic well the way historic patterns sometimes go is like an an extreme progressive reaction to trump like you know left of the the democratic party if that sort of flood happens the next step the next swing is like coup that's when the military goes, you know what? This has gone way too far. And that's when the coup happens. Right. That's that's my that's my worry. Not that I want yeah. I want it to go I want it to go as left as as possible. As left as the, you know, people uh, in the Midwest who are Democrats are still going to be on board with. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my uh that's my take on it. Yeah, I think that I my hope is that uh you know, Donald Trump ultimately just doesn't want to ever res- accept responsibility for anything. So if, you know, his advisors tell you, dude, it's over, you lost in a landslide, that, you know, there his, you know, insane saving grace would be, uh, well, I wouldn't have lost if there wasn't a pandemic because I was the most popular president ever. And I had the best economy, right. I had yeah. the best economy. I had the best everything. I did more in three years than any other president ever. And then this pandemic hit, which who could have known that a pandemic would have hit? And it took us all completely by surprise. And of course, I would have been, I would have waltzed into a second term without that. So like, let him say that all day. You knock yourself out, Donald, you know, but get yeah. out of the White House. So yeah. hopefully that's, that's what happens. Are, are the Secret Service obligated like at, on, you know, January 21st or again, I forget the exact date. Does their allegiance change at, at, all of a sudden? And then people who were his personal detail would then actually just have to grab him and remove him from the office, from the White House. Yeah, I have were. no idea how that would end up working. But I think like in a situation where there wasn't an election uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, I think I think on January 21st, 2021, 
Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont becomes president. <laughs> Did I read that correctly? Oh, really? Yeah. I think that's what happens um, because he's the, the, the oldest member. What, I don't think it's the oldest member. I think it's the most senior member of something. I, I'm unclear about it, but I found it amusing that I saw some blurb or tweet or something that said that Donald Trump just doesn't decide he gets to stay until further notice on January 21st. If there's no election, then Patrick Leahy is president. president. <laughs> and I don't know how you get Donald Trump out of the White House uh, in that situation. Do, you know, does anybody really want to see Donald Trump dragged out of the White House? Does he want to have anybody? And like, I don't know what happens. It's, it's all like, how can you predict anything that's going to happen? Like, there's no way that we could have predicted anything that's happened in the last three years because it all would have sounded completely ridiculous. It's so true. <laughs> Until the moment it happened, and then, oh, yeah, of course, because it's Donald Trump. So, yeah, I mean, I remember January 1st of this year thinking, yeah, 2020 is going to be a weird year. But in no realm was I thinking it was going to be this weird, you know? And we're only in, it's only, it's only May. We're just a quarter of the way through, basically. I know. I remember thinking, wow, Kobe Bryant died in a plane crash. Can't get worse than that. Uh, you know, I'm sure the election's going to be messed up, but that's the low light of 2020 for me is Kobe Bryant dying. And like, it seems like a million years ago now. That it, that it does. It does. And you were a, a huge Laker fan, like from way back. That must have been, I mean, that it, it hit everybody, but damn, that must've really hit you, dude. I bet it did. Huh? Yeah. My, my wife thought a member of my family died, um, and then she was sort of annoyed at me, like, it's only Kobe Bryant you're screaming hysterically about? I came downstairs because uh, somebody had texted me, Kobe Bryant's dead. And I, you know, what? I went and saw, you know, the news and came downstairs to, like, tell my wife about it. And by the time I got downstairs, I was crying hysterically and I I couldn't um, barely process what I was trying to say. And... Uh, my wife Colleen thought, you know, somebody in my family had been killed or something. And when I finally got Kobe Bryant out of my mouth, I think she was like, "Oh, well, that's sad too, but at least it's not somebody, uh, <laughs> not the member of your family." But yeah, I only remember having this experience one other time in 1979 when Thurman Munson, a catcher for the New York Yankees, died in a plane crash. He had a private plane that he crashed in Ohio, and we all found out about it. And I remember locking myself. I did exactly what I did. Like, we never change. I did exactly what I did <laughs> this year. I started bawling and then locked myself in the bathroom for 10 minutes. It's like I thought, well, you know, I'm in my 50s now. I'm not that <laughs> – I'm the same exact person as I was and, when totally, I was 14. Dude. Um, my, when uh, Prince died, my wife basically had the 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 same experience as you did. It was she was like just incredulous, couldn't talk. She called me on the phone and couldn't couldn't get it out. And uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah. The, some people they they mean a lot to you. You know, they have a they they have like a place and they're part of you in a way. And then all of your especially when they it's not of old age. It's an accident or something. And it's like. It just rocks your world. It's like, that's not supposed to happen, you know? Right. And at the same time, you kind of feel weird about it and guilty about it. It's like, why am I so upset about this person that I've never met? Or like, you know, uh, they don't know me. They've never, they, they, I mean nothing to them. It's their, you know, you kind of go through all these feelings of, of, uh, why am I so upset about this person? When you, and you realize that it's, it's about these emotional connections that you have, whether it's your, cousin your friend or Kobe Bryant that you've formed an emotional connection with this person because of their of what they mean to you what they've done the moments that you've in a way shared with them like yeah yeah you know you remember where you were uh when they did something great when he you know uh, uh when he hit 61 points or or you know a uh, great moment in the finals that you cheered about you feel you feel in a weird way like you shared that moment with them. Yeah, because um, it, cause it so, had that you know? it's had that same emotional like rush that they had and you had at the moment, and it's you know those are real. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's it's ultimately you you have to embrace the fact that yes, this is a real emotional connection that you have with a person because of an experience that you shared, whether it was virtually or otherwise. So it's incre- it's completely appropriate to be that upset about it. There's always the people out there, especially on social media right now, that uh, that question people's over-the-top reactions to celebrities dying. And I think, you know, there's a, also social media kind of amplifies reactions to everybody. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a celebrity dying every day, and somebody se- it seems to be somebody's favorite celebrity that they're, they're, they're completely distraught by. So I understand that there's, like, you know, levels of emotion that you should be applying to these things, but... When it's a legend like Kobe or Prince, how are you not going to be completely affected by that? Yeah, because you 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 have to recognize and embrace and you, their genius and and you know you realize you realize what a loss it is for everybody that you thought you were going to get a whole other chapter of this person's life that you're never going to get to see or hear. You know, and if you're if you're not affected, you you were never all in with those people anyway. You know what I mean? You, you you have to have been all in and and that's why you feel it i think yeah so you ultimately come to terms with the with the fact that you had this reaction and that, and you understand why and uh it's 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 just being human i think well um i think we covered my entire life let's see yes no mt yeah mtv sci-fi star trek star wars i hate trump we got it all okay Rick, I want to thank you so much uh, for doing this uh, over-the-phone interview. I think it, it worked out all right. Um, send me that audio file, and I'll put these things together and see what it sounds like. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm glad we could finally do it. I'm glad to hear that uh, you and uh, your family are doing well in the middle of all of this craziness, and, and, and I'm sure and, we'll see each other for real at some point soon. I hope so. Be safe, my friend. Thanks so much, man. All right, that was Rick Austin. Great interview. Thank you, Rick. Um, really appreciate you reaching out and making that happen. Considering we were in separate locations, I think that went fairly well. Um, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. I know it was a long one. My wife is going to do this next. She's She's been talking about it. I think it's really going to happen, so look forward to that next. I have to get a couple beers in her, and man, she'll start talking. So check out the website, manofconvictionpodcast.com, or drop me an email at manofconvictionpodcast at gmail.com. I'm going to put some videos up on the website under Rick Austin's page, so go check that out. And uh, if you do, and it's not there, then send me an angry email. That way I know there's actually people out there listening. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Ciao for now.